hey, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you if you're a believer. You can walk in that truth. You have the power to defeat this sin. You have the power to battle this sin. So let's figure out how we can do that together. That's the more positive way of saying, it's not saying your sin doesn't matter. It's not saying there's no consequences or there's no rules. It's just saying, hey, you've got the power actually to walk this route. Let's walk it together. Let's figure this out. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Shelby Abbott, and your hosts are Dave and Ann Wilson. You can find us at familylifetoday.com. This is Family Life Today. All right, Family Life Today, Friday Five. Woo! We got another Friday Five where we give you the five most life changing, life altering, deep, biblical. Yeah, it's going to change your life. You cannot turn this thing off (laughs) right now. And we got Jared and Becky Wilson back in the studio. (laughs) No pressure, though, you guys. So you talk about good. It's going to be beyond good. It's going to be the greatest of the greatest because it's Wilson squared. Oh, that's right. (laughs) It is. That's right. I just came up with that. Jared and Becky Wilson, Dave and Ann Wilson. And no, we're not related. They have a lot more hair than we do. (laughs) Than I do, <laughs> something like that. But um, you know, we've had you guys on the last couple of days. Thank you. It's been awesome. It's mm-hmm. really been awesome. And and we gotta let our listeners know this is just out of nowhere. We just came up with this at the end of the session <laughs> yesterday because we, we know said, it's gonna be rich. Yeah. Well, this morning, Jared, you did a devotional for our team here, the audio team at Family Life, about five essentials for a gospel-centered life. I guess you gave us three. Yeah. And somehow in the next 20 minutes, Ann and I got to come up with two. Yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> but we're going to call it You already it said it's going to be rich and life transforming. It's going to be right. So, so I can't yeah. wait. How about over promise, under deliver? <laughs> How about that one? Um, but it's five essentials today is going to be five essentials for a gospel centered family, okay. marriage and family. Let's stop there because we talk about gospel centered, gospel yeah. rich. We just throw out those terms. And some people are thinking, what, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? Because I hear those words all the time, but what's it really mean? Well, that's the concern and why I have these sort of three implications for the substance of gospel centrality is because it's become more of a cultural identifier. It's become sort of the trendy jargon to say we have uh, you know gospel centered messages and we go to our gospel groups and have gospel pizza with our gospel <laughs> friends you know um, on our gospel Thursday nights you we know. drink gospel milk from a gospel cow exactly <laughs> right. and I'm one of the worst offenders I mean I've got numerous books with gospel as an adjective in in the title and I think that's fine so long as we don't miss out on what the substance is and so to be gospel centered is an alternative to other ways of being centered right so what are the primary ways that we're usually centered in the Christian life. And if you're looking at just sort of the historical evangelicalism, we have really the distinction between law and gospel is the important contrast that we see in just kind of reformational Protestantism. And so to be gospel-centered is to is the alternative to being law-centered, to being centered on the commandments of God versus being centered on the promises of God or the indicatives of God. So it's not um, to say that the law is bad or the commandments are bad or anything like that. And I like to tell you know my students uh, quite a bit, to be gospel-centered is not to be gospel-only, mm. it's to be gospel-centered. So gospel centrality is not gospel onlyism it's just gospel centrism. So that's kind of the first distinction to make. But to get into the substance of it kind of gets us into these five essentials that we're going to talk about, right? Mm. Yeah, and do you want to start with first Corinthians yeah, 15? For sure. The first uh, place that I would take somebody, they said, where is this even in the Bible, I, this gospel-centered thing? And, you know, the phrase is fairly new, and I'm not married to a phrase, but to the concept is is biblical. Uh, in First Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul tells us what the gospel is, first of all, which is super helpful um, in days of confusion and kind of murkiness about what the good news is. He says it's that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He goes on to talk about the you know appearance of Christ after the resurrection to you know the multitudes and the rest of the chapter. 
1 Corinthians 15 is about just sort of the implications of the resurrection and the theology of the resurrection, those sorts of things. But just in the first four verses of the chapter, we have not just the summation of the gospel, but an indication that it's bigger than we thought it was, mm. that it is richer than we thought it was. And so the first implication you know, that I like to share is that the Bible is all about Jesus, that the entire Bible is all about Jesus, because Paul says there, Christ died in accordance with the scriptures, and that he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. So he's telling us that the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ is foreshadowed, is retold, is according to the plan of the Bible. The scriptures for Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 refers to what we call the Old Testament. So it's telling us the Old Testament is about the gospel. And that's not the first place or the only place that we see that, of course. We have Jesus throughout the gospels reframing everyone's interpretation of the scriptures around himself. He reads from Isaiah in in the synagogue there, and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. He tells the Pharisees, you search the scriptures thinking you're gonna find eternal life in them, but they testify to me. When you look at the apostolic preaching from Peter and onwards after the ascension of Christ, what they're doing is taking an Old Testament text, the the very first Christian sermon in Acts chapter two, this is Peter's sermon at Pentecost. He's reading from the Psalms and Joel, and he's preaching those texts in the light of Christ. We have the whole book of Hebrews that tells us how Christ is the center, the culmination of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. So for families, it's, you know, who are interested in doing family devotions or just raising their children in the admonition of the Lord, you're looking to the scriptures, you're looking to the Bible, of course, for your instructions, for your inspiration, et cetera. We need to remember that the importance of the Bible is not just that it tells us what to do. The most important thing about the Bible is that it tells us what God has done in Christ, Mm. that the whole thing is about Jesus. So when we're sharing scripture with each other, reminding each other of the scriptures, we need to be reminding each other of Jesus as well. All right, give us number two. We're going to make you do all three. So the number one was the Bible is all about Jesus. Yeah, the whole Bible is all about Jesus. The second principle of gospel centrality is that people change. This is a little more controversial. That people change by grace and not by law. So the kind of change that matters, and in families, we're we're so interested in behavioral change, aren't we? Oh yeah. And we think now. we know. Yeah, right we now. we <laughs> think we know how to get that behavioral change, and sometimes we do know what will get behavioral change, but it's not the ultimate win. So, if you think about it, you know, you want your kids to pick up after themselves. You know, wives they want their husbands to you know put their dishes in the <laughs> sink or to pick up their dirty clothes and put them in the hamper or whatever it is. But more than that, we don't want just want them to do that. We want them to want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to have to tell them to do that. Uh, the way we think change comes about is number one, we tell people to change, <laughs> and when that doesn't work, we raise the volume. You know, we tell them in a louder way, and then when that doesn't work, we tell them more often and we bring in consequences. <laughs> And we have a word for how this works out in the household, right? It's called nagging. <laughs> and the reason we know it doesn't work is because we have that special word for it. If it worked, we would just say, I told him, you know, yeah. it would just be telling. I told him and they did it. But we call it nagging because you got to keep telling them and you got to tell them over and over again and you get frustrated. But then even if you get someone to change that way, behaviorally, it's still not the win. You want them to change at the heart level, Right. Because you can, if you nag hard enough, people will be like, I'm just tired of hearing it. Of course, yeah, I'll pick my clothes up, right? But then they're doing it out of frustration or bitterness or just so you'll shut up. That's not the change that we want. We want change at the heart level. And the the Bible says that that kind of change doesn't come about through the law. It doesn't come about just by telling people to change and bringing in consequences. It actually comes through the Holy Spirit working through the message of grace. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that this gospel, you received it, right? Your conversion experience, past tense. He says, you're standing in it, present tense. We're gonna come back to that. But he says, you're being saved, present, future tense. So somehow the work of progressive sanctification, becoming more like Christ over time, is empowered by the good news. The announcement that the work is done somehow empowers us to work, which is so counter- intuitive. It's so counter the flesh. It's so counter natural. It's a supernatural idea, but you see it all over the scriptures. In fact, in Titus chapter two, Paul says it's grace that trains us to renounce ungodliness, to live repentant lives. It's grace that does that, not the law. In second Corinthians three, Paul says it's by seeing the glory of Christ that we are changed. 
It's not the law that does that. It's seeing the glory of Jesus and the gospel that changes us. So somehow we have to understand that, especially sinful behavior, not just you know behavior that you and I don't like because it's inconvenient, but stuff that's a sin, actual sin. Sinful behavior comes from disbelief of some kind. Every sinful action is the result of a disordered worship. And the way to rightly order our worship is to see the glory of Christ in the gospel. I'm thinking of the people that wanted to be around Jesus. Yeah. You know, they they weren't clamoring to be around any of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. But man, these sinful people were clamoring. They couldn't wait to be with Jesus. And it's not out of the law because the Pharisees were doing that. But I think it was out of his grace, exactly what you're saying. They couldn't wait to be with them because it was so radical, especially in that time to see any kind of grace and a man of God giving and offering grace. Who wouldn't want to be? I mean, how do we balance that as parents? Because there's got to be a sense of law and rule and boundaries. We all know that as parents, but then we want to be grace-giving. So there's that tension. Yeah, so it, again, this is not gospel only in ism. So we understand that the law has a place and it, we just need to keep it in the right place. So we have rules, we have the rules of the household, we have the um, expectations, obligations, and accountability in place for you know good guardrails. But we understand that the real win is not just well-behaved kids who don't have hearts for us, you know, much less for Jesus, because again, the Pharisees were very well behaved. We want hearts that are changed. So we see the law then as a response to the goodness of God. It's our worship that we that we give to God, not as a means of earning. So we placate those that we fear, and some Christian households would be perfectly content. Mm. I want them to fear me, mm. and that, and and therefore they're going to act right. Right? Obedience so, is the ultimate. Yeah, so we'll placate those that we fear, but we'll want to please those that we love. Mm. And I, I think the fear is if I center love, then they're just going to go do what they want, right? Just like Paul mm. is countering the the argument. Well, you preach grace enough, people are just going to go sin. They're going to think you're going to give them license to go do whatever they want. Well, someone who acts that way doesn't un- really understand grace. They actually haven't been transformed by grace. And so I think the laws are there, the the rules are there in in a household to give us the the road to go down, but the love is there to give us the energy to go down that road. And when we stray off the road, it's there to help us see that, you know, there's no misbehavior that's going to put you outside of my approval of you. You're my son, you're my daughter, and I'm, I, I love you no matter what. Daddy and, and mommy, we mess up on, on rules all the time. We go afoul of God's rules, and yet he never withdraws his love from us. So we're never going to withdraw our, our love from you. These rules are there to keep you safe. They're ultimately for your happiness, whether you know that or mm-hmm. not. Um, but we want you to know that you following the rule, these rules is not what's going to get me to accept you or to love you. Let me put it real practical, yeah. okay? Let's say you have a 17-year-old that came home from a party and they were drunk. But -hmm. it was also past their curfew. And so here you are, you want to demonstrate this grace, but also you have some rules in your family. Tell us what this conversation could look like and how it's demonstrating the gospel. I think the main issue there is tone. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you say to them, everything's fine, don't worry. You know, that's not grace. That's, I don't know what that is, but it's not what we're talking about here. I think That's just niceness. <laughs> yeah, I think you tell them the truth in love and you say to them, I'm not angry. I don't love you less. I'd be angry. <laughs> but I, I just mean, you know, yeah. you want them to know, I don't love you any less, but the thing that you did was very irresponsible. Terrible things could have happened. There's a reason we have rules against this. So, you know, we need to deal with that. How can we go to the Lord together and ask Him to help you with this behavior? Because it's it's not okay. It's not safe. It's not good for you. It's not good for our family. So I think it's more about the tone than the actual words. You don't want to yeah. just scream and yell at them. You know, you want to say, I have grace for you. That doesn't mean you say what you did is fine. It's not fine, you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, the tone piece is like, it's like your posture as well. So you can stand above and sort of bring the word of condemnation. You know, you broke the rules, et cetera. 
or you can be with them yeah. and say, like, I'm not happy with you. Um, I'm angry that you broke the rules. But as as she just said, like, let's figure this out together. There's going to be consequences for breaking the rules here, but I want to help you. I'm, I'm for you. I, I'm not, this isn't, you know, you're breaking the rule doesn't set me against you as a, as your condemner. It means I, I want to figure out how to come alongside you and, and, and help you because this isn't healthy for you. If, if this goes unchecked, mm-hmm. if, if we don't have a rule about this, it actually is going to lead to a very unhealthy place, even, you know, potentially a deadly place, right? Mm-hmm. So, I want to be alongside you and let's figure this out together, how we can make sure this never happens again. And I do that because I love you, yeah. because there's nothing you can do that's going to put you outside of my love for you and I mean, my desire to be for you. In some ways, and maybe I'm missing it, it, it's almost like when Paul says the law leads us to grace. It's like a tutor. The it's tutor, like a, yeah. It's sort of what we're doing and sometimes we Well, even when think about alongside. when he confronts— he talks about in Galatians, he confronts Peter, right? And when Peter is playing, he's being a two-face, yeah. right? Sitting with the Gentiles until the men from James come. And then he's like, oh, I don't know those guys, you know. And Paul could have said any, any number of things to him and re- rebuking him to his face, he says, he could have said like, hey, you broke the rule about hypocrisy. You're being a hypocrite. You yeah. know, he could have re- rebuked his sin there. You know, Peter's being kind of a racist in that moment. Um, in fact, like, you, you know, you're being a racist. He could have said any of those things. But he doesn't say any of those things. He basically says, your conduct is not in step with the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. He calls him back to the indicative, not to the imperatives, to say, hey, if you really believe this, if you actually are a good news person, your behavior should show that. It It should be conducive with this stuff we actually believe. And I think that's another piece of it as well. With, with anyone, a, a child or anyone, that, that you're trying to help someone battle their sin is to say, hey, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you if you're a believer. You can walk in that truth. You have the power to defeat this sin. You have the power to battle this sin. So let's figure out how we can do that together. That's the more positive way of saying, it's not saying your sin doesn't matter. It's not saying there's no consequences or there's no rules. It's just saying, hey, you've got the power actually to walk this route, let's walk it together. Let's figure this out. It's good. Yeah, I know, and we don't have time to get into it, but our listeners have heard many times, but Anne tried to change me for decades hmm. with her words. And like you said, that didn't work, so she got louder and then said it more. <laughs> I was good at nagging. And she's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, nagging. And I did the same thing, but she's writing right now about it. The thing that changed me was grace. And again, it isn't just I tolerate your sin and it doesn't matter. No, it was you've got goodness in you. There's greatness in you. I see this in you. It's like, I want to become a better man. That's you know? right. Well, it's kind of like coaching. Grace. We we think that yeah. way through, you know, yeah. we see that in coaching. I mean, I, you know, silly example, but I think of like in college, there were professors I had that there was, it didn't matter what you did. It was always going to, like, they were going to give you a bad grade. Yeah. And at some point I realized like, there, this I cannot yeah. surpass this bar. I just gave up. Yeah. yeah, why try? But then I had other professors. It seemed like everything I did, they liked, and they liked me, and it was a pleasant experience being in there. Now you, you would think that I would take advantage of that, and maybe some people did, but it made me want to please them. You yeah. wanted to rise. I to wanted the to do better. I wanted to rise to the occasion. I wanted to be what they thought I was. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I think it it, it actually works th- that too. way. Sometimes. All right, we're Friday five, and we've only got two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we've got so, three minutes left. We're going to move quickly. We might be Friday three. Might be Give Friday the three. the third one. Yeah, the third one is that my validation, my ultimate validation comes not from my work, but from Christ's work on my behalf. Mm. Uh, I think so many Christians live their life functionally as if the Lord is happy with them when they're doing enough, being enough, you know, accomplishing enough, and the Lord is displeased with them when they're not, that they're on some kind of scale that God is constantly measuring. And what we see Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is that, no, this gospel, you stand in it present tense. The big theological concept for this is the imputation of Christ's righteousness, which basically just means what Jesus did is credited to us as if it is ours. Mm -hmm. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He takes our sin, he gives us his perfect obedience. So we're clothed in that every minute of every day. When you wake up in the morning, God looks at you with favor. He's not saying, all right, let's see what you got today and I'll render my verdict at the end of the day. And he's not at the end of the day, no matter how the day is gone. He's not at the end of the day going, I thought you were better than this. This is not, you know, who I thought you were. At the end of the day, his favor is over you because of 
Christ. Mm. Now imagine if we brought that into our households yeah. that we're not, you know, waking each other up with like, all right, let's see what you got. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'm happy with you if you produce for me. That's sometimes how we treat each other, but that's not how the holy God of the universe treats us, which is just amazing to me. Yeah, The only one with the right to do that (laughs) says, no, that verdict was decided on the cross. Mm -hmm. The work is finished. The record of debt is canceled. I clothe you with my son's perfect obedience, and that's how I regard you every day of your life from here on out. I mean, that's hard to do as a parent of a teenager. <laughs> you know? Well, sure. Because you're sort of looking at him like, let's see what you got, yeah. you know? <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's not going to happen today, what happened yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dave Wilson with the necessary wet blanket there, but a true one. Yes, a very true one. So by my counting, we've heard three out of the five essentials for gospel-centered families. We're about to hear a fourth one in just a second, and we may never get to the fifth, but you don't listen to Family Life Today for exceptional math prowess, so who cares about the numbers? I'm Shelby Abbott, and you've been listening to Dave and Ann Wilson with Jared and Becky Wilson on Family Life Today. It's been a Wilson day by every sense of the word, and it's been incredible. You know, Jared Wilson has written a book called Love Me Anyway, How God's Perfect Love Fills Our Deepest Longings. This book really explores the universal human longing for unconditional love through the lens of 1 Corinthians 13. So if that is something that sounds like you want to pick up, you can go online to familylifetoday.com where you can find that book by Jared Wilson in the show notes section at the bottom of the page. Or you can give us a call at 800-358-6329. Again, that number is 800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. And you know, this ministry is made possible by partners who give to Family Life every single month. And as a Family Life partner, you don't just get the opportunity to be able to give to a ministry that is literally changing marriages and families all over the world. You get exclusive benefits as well. Often we hear from listeners who want to dive a little deeper into some of the topics that we share here on Family Life today. And if that is you, I'd love it if you consider partnering with us here at Family Life. As a partner, you're making a monthly gift that will not only give you the benefit of receiving a free gift card to attend a weekend to remember marriage getaway, you also gain access to many other opportunities to take action alongside Family Life, such as you become an insider with ministry updates about new products, pre-releases, and exclusive viewing opportunities. You get invitation-only events with unique opportunities to hear insider information about what God is doing through your partnership and special communications from Family Life Leadership. You get access to our new curated topical library from some of the most compassionate minds across the ministry, and you get membership to our new private partners-only social network. As a Family Life partner, you equip marriages, parents, and families to impact our culture for Christ. So you can become a partner by going online to familylifetoday.com and clicking on the Donate Now button at the top of the page. It'll walk you through what to do from there. Or you can call us with your donation at 800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. Or you can feel free to drop us a donation in the mail. Our address is Family Life, 100 Lake Hart Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32832. All right, so here's essential number four and maybe five. You tell me if you hear it for a gospel-centered family. Well, I had this one thought. You know, it's in the beginning of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received. In some ways, I think as a parent, we just need to keep reminding ourselves and then our family or our kids, we've received Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep telling the story to your kids and keep living the story of the gospel in your life. You're going to fall. Yeah. Yeah. And he's redeemed you. You're going to step. He redeemed you. He's The resurrected Christ lives in you. So I think our kids should see that that mom and dad are walking in this every single day too. That's what the gospel-centered mom and dad look like in a marriage, but it also it, it, it permeates a, a, a home. It's in the, it's the aroma. It's the environment of the home. I think too, and to give our kids a vision of how they fit into the gospel. Hmm. 
you know, of that God created them on purpose, for a purpose, and it's not by their own righteousness, it's not by anything that they can earn, but there's a place for them in the kingdom that's so much greater and more fulfilling than anything they will taste in the world. And it's his grace that sets him free too. Yeah. The reminder is really important, isn't it? Yeah. And I would remind you, even that's an important principle yeah. because we don't wake up in this sort of grace mode. You know, we, we wake up set on law, I think. Mm. And so we have to intentionally reset in some way on the good news. I like that. Yeah. Now, coming up next week, what's the power of gratitude, letting go of worries, and filling your mind with positivity? Well, one of Family Life Today's favorites, Brant Hansen, is going to be here to talk about that and his new book called Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance. That's next week. We hope you'll join us. On behalf of David Ann Wilson, I'm Shelby Abbott. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a donor-supported production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.